Hey guys, and welcome to another educational video. In fact, this is gonna be an epic education because I learned so much in preparation for this video. Uh, we're gonna talk about some antique cults, which I knew almost nothing about. And I'm betting, unless you are an antique collector, uh, if you're like me and you like German Lugers and 1911 cults, um, this is all new to you. Now, don't flip me off because I'm gonna tell you some really cool stories about how the West was won. And this will be like a Clint Eastwood movie by the time we're done. So today we're gonna to talk about the Colt Patterson. Uh, I didn't even know what a Colt Patterson was. I actually thought Colt and Patterson uh, came together and partnered on this project, but in fact, Patterson is Patterson, New Jersey. That shows you how much I didn't know. But Samuel Colt, who you can see here, he partnered with um, a board of directors that basically were his investors. And he made uh, a factory in Patterson, New Jersey and put out the Colt Patterson. Uh, so I have a couple of these. They rarely come up on auction, uh, but I happen to have a local collector who has uh, a couple of them, and I thought I would take this opportunity to share them with you. So in preparation for the video, I did a lot of background and, and research, and I learned so much. I found it absolutely fascinating. I can't wait to show it to you. Pretty much every source that you read will tell you that the Colt Patterson was the first commercially manufactured revolving cylinder. And that was the revolutionary concept uh, from Samuel Colt. This is the middle variation, uh, meaning there's basically three uh, major variations. In fact, there's all different kinds, including engraves and uh, longer barrels, shorter barrels. There's all kinds of combinations, but they only made 2,300 of these. So there's not a whole lot, but the, there's, uh, there's several combinations. This is the middle category, which they refer to as the belt model. There's actually a pocket model, which I'll show you in a minute, a belt model, and a holster model. Now the belt model and the holster model sound like they would be the same thing, but the holster is actually at that time implied that you keep it in your saddlebag. So it's, it's a little bit larger. So we have small, medium, and large, kind of like a Starbucks coffee. So before this, when you think about a uh, revolving or, or a multi-shot pistol, uh, you probably think of the pepper box. We happen to have one here. Uh, again, we don't usually have these. Um, let me come closer and you can take a look. Okay, so I don't know the exact era of this one, but the pepper box, uh, it was basically featured. And, and by the way, they had a revolving barrel uh, flint locks. Uh, this one is actually uh, early 1800s because this is, this is a percussion uh, gun. Uh, it had several downsides. One would be that this the barrel would become hot when you shot it, and so you would have to rotate it. And of course, with a hot barrel, uh, that would burn your hand. So it wasn't ideal. You can see that that's where the the nipple is. Don't tell my mother I said nipple on YouTube, but that's where the nipple is. And you put the percussion cap, um, and you fire it. Hits the, hits the percussion cap and ignites the powder. Uh, you preload them. You're able to get six shots uh, by, ro by manually rotating the barrel. And so this was the early development and it did not work real well. Uh, although I guess in a crisis, you would just make it work or wear gloves. The other problem is the barrels, especially on the rifles and the longer barrels, made them incredibly heavy. Um, you actually see the same concept uh, later on with the Gatling gun. Of course, that used a cartridge, but so this is the one of the early attempts of a multi-shot flintlock or uh, percussion weapon. So the beauty of Samuel Colt's invention was one barrel rotating cylinder. Um, now Samuel Colt, in reading uh, reading the story of his life, and of course after he became rich and famous, um, and by the way, I did look up that when he died, he was worth 15 million. Uh, that's significant because today that would be, you know, hundreds of millions. But um, he died uh, rich and famous, uh, even though he started out, he didn't have money. He didn't have the money to actually start the factory. He had to bring in investors. Uh, but he was also a very proud man. Um, uh, they describe him as being excessively litigious which means he sued all his partners at one time or another, sued his board members. Um, he sued a lot of people. Um, and that really brings us to the story of this cylinder. He actually took a trip halfway around the world. From what I could tell, he went all the way to India, but he was working on a uh, passenger ship. 
and he, he tells the story that he came up with the idea of the rotating cylinder by watching a paddle wheel on a riverboat. And it gave him this idea, and he actually defended that in court, told that story a number of times. And so it is recorded in history. If you read about where did he come up with this idea, he insists that he came up with it by watching the paddle wheel when he was on this ship. But I found another source. Turns out that it was a, a result of a lawsuit. Uh, there was actually a, another uh, rotating cylinder. It was uh, the Collier's Flintlock. You can see a picture of the Collier's Flintlock, and um, right away it, it really reminds me of um, the, the Patterson or even the Walker. You'll see in a minute when you, we look at the uh, Walker, which is one of the last guns we'll look at, even the trigger uh, guard looks about the same. In this case, it's a flintlock, and it was made in 1814. So a full 20 years before Samuel Cole came up with his invention. And you can see the rotating cylinder and a flintlock. Now, the downside to this particular invention, and this is in England, uh, they made them in England, they were handmade, so technically it wasn't commercially manufactured, these were handmade guns. Uh, I don't know how many they made, but they're very, very rare. If I flip one picture back, you can see that uh, there's drawings here, um, but they also made a rotating barrel flintlock rifle. Uh, so when I found this, this was news to me because, again, Colt gets credit for making the first revolving cylinder when, in fact, 20 years earlier, uh, Collier made one a as a flintlock. As I said, uh, the downside uh, to this, however, is the rotating cylinder is manually rotated. So you would shoot the flintlock, you would rotate the cylinder and shoot it again. For some reason, that design did not take off. Uh, now, the problem is we need to connect Samuel Colt to seeing that design. And in fact, when he was on his trip around the, uh, halfway around the world, he stopped in London, England, and it is documented the day he visited the uh, London Tower the Tower of London, I guess that is. Uh, he visited the museum at the Tower of London and this gun was on display. And so we basically know he saw it. Uh, he said he got the idea from the paddle wheel um, and we'll leave it to you to make up your own uh, mind. But I find this incredibly uh, similar um, to, the, to the Patterson design. And in fact, if you look at the trigger, this trigger guard, the cutout, uh, and this trigger guard is very similar. Um, and actually the bell, see the, uh, what they call a bell bottom uh, grip, bell bottom grip, and here's, um, here's the Patterson, the first design, uh, did not have a loading rod. Uh, we'll talk about that later, they added the loading rod, but that's the first design with the, the bell grip and the bell grip. So I find it a little hard to believe that if he saw that, that that didn't influence his thinking. But again, he wanted to make sure he got credit for the patent. And uh, in my opinion, the design change, uh, he did get a patent in England, France, and the United States for this design. And he vigorously defended his patent uh, and sued several people who tried to develop similar models, including Smith & Wesson. So these are the first two models I already mentioned. This is the pocket pistol. It's amazing to me that he actually made one this small, but this is the pocket pistol. When we look at the profile, there's a couple things that stand out. Now these have the loading rods, but the earliest ones, and this is 1836, up until 1839, they had no loading rod. So the profile, what you notice right away is no loading rod on this one and no trigger. Uh, that stands out. And so when I'm, you know, if you're at an auction or at a gun show, you probably would never see this at a gun show. But if you saw one at a gun show, the thing that stands out right away is the no loading rod and the trigger. Uh, on these two, and, and again, this is a local collector. I don't want to uh, cover up the grip because they're just beautiful. I, I assume that's like a rosewood and these are blued finish. Uh, these are all original. Uh, you can see they have a cylinder design, although it would be hard, it would be hard to see without magnification. We got a cylinder design, and here we have a cylinder design. And the serial numbers on these, I'll, pull, I'll take one apart to show you where the serial numbers are, because they're internal, not external. There's no serial number externally. Uh, it does have the, the wedge that uh, was unique to Colt. The Colt Patterson was the first one 
uh, and they use that all the way through to the single action armies. But let's talk about the, the loading rod because that, that makes this really important because before the loading rod, so if you look at it like that, so you get five shots, this is five shot, and it comes in 36 cali caliber. Now the pocket, the pocket came in 28 caliber. The middle, the middle size one, uh, which is the belt model, came in 36. And let me introduce the holster model. Here is the holster model. Now, right away, um, this is way too beautiful, so I, I need to say this is a replica. Um, but it would be, you know, it was hard for him to get all three variations. The first two are original. This is a replica, very well made. Uh, again, you can see that it has the loading rod and no trigger. This one is engraved with uh, the pearl grips. This model, which is the holster model, is also 36. Now this would fit in a holster, but more commonly it was kept in a saddlebag because these were used by soldiers, uh, cavalry soldiers. Um, they also called them dragoons, uh, which later on led to the name dragoon, uh, that Colt made a dragoon. Uh, this is uh, much heavier, uh, but the same caliber as the middle size. So this, those are the sizes. So let's pick on the middle child. I'm a middle child, so we'll pick on the middle child. That happened to me all the time growing up. But um, this is the middle child. Uh, so we'll, we'll take this one apart. Um, the, the loading rod was added later. So they began to use the loading rod in 39. So again, they made these in 1836. 39, they added the loading rod because without it, you had to take the wedge out the cylinder out, reload it. So basically you take the gun apart, put it back together again. So you get five shots and you're done. Now, uh, as we will hear soon in a famous Indian battle, each of the Texas Rangers had one of these. Of course, they weren't engraved. They look more like this, but this size, they each had two of these. And so in this famous uh, Indian battle with the Comanche Indians in Texas, uh, they had 10 shots and then they had to reload. So without the loading rod, it was quite an ordeal to take it all apart and reload it. With the loading rod, it's a little bit easier. Now, the serial numbers on these are pretty early. So I know these originally came with no loading rod. And then when the loading rod was added, you can kind of see that they made the alteration uh, to include the loading rod. So uh, it helps a lot because with the loading rod, they also added this cutout in the cylinder. So it would allow you to put the percussion cap on without taking it down, then also put in your powder and the ball and then the loading rod to compress it together and ready to fire. Oh, let me show you ready to fire. So where's the trigger? When you pull the hammer back, the trigger pops down. This one, the spring, that didn't, I, I don't want to use this too much because this, one of the design flaws, this, this trigger is very, very frail. And for the military, they actually said, um, please improve it because the, the trigger is too frail. But we'll try that again. I don't know that it'll pop down, but it, it will pop down. Eric, see it starts to come down. But the way that they normally would work on this replica, it pops down immediately. And then you fire it. Let's try it again. When you pull the trigger, it pops down. We'll try the baby. Here's the baby. Pull the trigger back. And it works. Again, I'll let it down. We'll do it one more time. Pops down. So that one works perfectly. Again, just look at that, how frail that is. Uh, I just I can't imagine putting this all together, especially on this one, which is a heavy, it's a, it's a heavy cylinder, heavy barrel. Uh, this is a heavy gun uh, to have a trigger that is that flimsy is just, um, yeah, I would seem like the, they could have come up with something better, which they did on the next design. Okay, so just like the Single Action Army, most of you are probably f more familiar with the Single Action Army. We've sold quite a few of those, um, and that was a very successful pistol, and some would say that's the gun that won the West, but this is the precursor to the gun that won the West. Uh, if you half cock it, then the cylinder will move. Timing on this is good, by the way. You pull out the wedge, which I, I loosened. Normally it wouldn't be this loose. Uh, now this, this screw will capture it, meaning it, it, doesn't, um, it doesn't get lost. So I leave the screw in um, 
because it will capture it, keep it from getting lost, and that just pulls apart. Uh, you load it up by taking the cylinder out, the, the ones without the loading rod. You take the cylinder out. Um, this is numbered, hopefully you can see that. This is number 115, so that's marked on the frame. Then the barrel is also marked uh, 115. This is upside down. I hope you can see that, 115. It does have a, a rifled barrel. So for accuracy, uh, this has a rifled barrel. Now, uh, the research, I'm not going to shoot this, obviously. People who shoot the replicas, and they're exact replicas, they tell me that these are accurate up to 50 feet. However, uh, the anecdotal records say that as a cavalry officer shooting these uh, while riding a horse, uh, the accuracy was more like 10 yards. Okay, we also have the cylinder. You can see the scene a little better on the cylinder. And if you look at the cylinder, you can see one, one, five. So the cylinder is numbered and this is all matching. And just to add icing to the cake, check out the wedge. We know from single action armies, they even numbered the wedge. And that one is, is very clear. So the parts are all numbered and all matching. Uh, this was an early one. Uh, they later added the loading rod and this is how this works. You can see how it, it presses the ball and the powder. Um, into the back of the cylinder and allows the percussion cap to ignite. So before 1839, without the, uh, the loading rod, you would have to take it apart, load up five more rounds. And, and again, if you're in a battle, you probably only get the five shots and then you're done. With the wedge out, this pops together really easily. So it's really not a, a big ordeal that pops together and then you close the wedge. Now, uh, one thing that I also found difficult, and I tried it even with the rep replica, the uh, loading rod, you have to line them up just right. And often, I don't get it on the first shot. Like, it, I hit, I hit, I move it a little bit, there it goes. So, it's not, it's not real easy when you're loading five of these and the Indians are shooting at you, or the, uh, the Mexicans are shooting at you. These, by the way, the reason I say that is not because I'm a racist. These were actually used in the Indian Wars in Florida in the 1830s, in Texas in the 1830s, throughout the West, most notably in Texas, but also they were used in the Mexican-American War, and then finally they were used all the way into the Civil War. Okay, let's talk about the next chapter of this story, and that would be bankruptcy. First of all, this was the most popular model. Now, again, imagine this not engraved and just with the wooden grip. This model, the holster model, was the most popular. Um, there were 2,300 pistols made, and of those, 1,000 of them went to Texas. They actually went to the Texas Navy, the Texas Rangers, Texas Cavalry. Um, so 1,000 of the 2,300 went to Texas. In addition, the factory made a um, rotating barrel rifle and rotating barrel shotgun. The most successful, of course, was the pistol, uh, with this being the most successful model. So how in the world did they go bankrupt? As I mentioned before, they started making these in 1836, um, and they made them all the way to 1941 or 42, depending on where you cut it off, because 41, they stopped making uh, these, and instead, um, Colt declared bankruptcy, ran out of money. One of his investors, a man named Eller, uh, he then took over the factory. He, I guess he had the most money involved, so he bought the remaining inventory, the remaining parts, had 500 more put together. So post-bankruptcy, he put together 500 guns. My understanding is those are all mismatched guns. The ones that I've shown you here today, including this replica, are all matching guns. So technically, these were made before 1831. And in fact, these two originals both have early serial numbers. So it probably were made around uh, 1838 and then were modified with the uh, loading rod and the cutout in the cylinder. 
So why bankruptcy? Well, there's uh, several theories. First of all, I mentioned that Samuel uh, Colt was uh, a bit litigious and maybe the partners were arguing. I, I think, I, I know he took some of them to court and they, they argued a lot about how the money was split. Uh, that's never good for a company. So maybe it was disputes with some of his uh, financial partners. Uh, the second reason is people say that the gun was too expensive. Uh, what's interesting about this one, uh, this uh, was put together by by the way, this is the powder powder loader, and um, you press it down, and it discharges the right amount of powder. And then you could make the ball with one of these. These are all original, and this is original. Uh, this comes to seventeen dollars and fifty cents. And in fact, from this period of time, that's about what just the gun cost. So with the accessories, the total cost of this was about $20. So imagine a $20 gold piece, which at that time um, was a lot of money. If we put it in today's dollars, a $20 gold piece is worth about $3,000. Yet this gun is probably worth now about $100,000. So what is a better investment? For you young collectors out there, is gold a better investment or an antique rare gun? Obviously, um, this would be about $3,000 in cost, uh, and yet the gun today, it, it, I see them selling anywhere from 50 to 100,000, but some, ones, some of them that were attributed to someone special, uh, they've gone a, as high as a half a million dollars. So the second theory is they were just uh, too expensive for the average um, buyer, and yet the Texas uh, Rangers uh, ordered a thousand of them. So it seems to me that the orders were there if they had marketed a little bit. Uh, some people said it had design flaws, but in my way of thinking, if you ma manufacture something and it's version 1.0, uh, you make alterations when you get feedback from people. Um, and the final explanation would be that during this period of time, there was a banking crisis. I'd have to go back and look up the history of it, but um, some of the literature said that there was a banking crisis. You combine that with it was just too much money, and um, Samuel Colt was arguing with his investors. The, ca the company went bankrupt. So let's talk a little bit more about the history of this gun. Uh, if you look at the thumbnail, we talk about how this gun uh, won the West. And I said before that if it weren't for the state of Texas, uh, we might not have a Colt factory today. Let me talk about that a little bit. There was a captain in the Rangers, the Texas Rangers, named Jack Hayes. And there was another captain named Sam Walker. These are both historical figures. And, uh, and, and really famous in Texas history lore. Now, uh, the reason I say Texas history lore, no offense to the state of Texas, I, I gave you credit for the fact that you kept cold alive. But what I find, you know how everything is bigger in Texas? Well, the stories also get bigger in Texas. Uh, the only way I could explain it is there was, there was no form of communication other than people telling other people. And by the time the story got back east by Whisper Down the Lane, uh, you would see the published stories and on the East Coast, they would tell the stories of the Texas Rangers and the, uh, the revolving uh, cylinder cult um, and how the West was won. Uh, some of those stories were greatly embellished. And, and I'll tell you a little bit about what I found. So Jack Hayes of the Texas Rangers, um, he went after some Comanche Indians who were uh, attacking some of the settlers in the area. Uh, there had actually had been a war with the Comanches and other Indians going on for um, a, a, at at least a decade. And in those battles, the Texas Rangers barely could hold their own. They would end up, um, you know, they would fight for a little bit and then run away because the Indians far outnumbered the settlers. But a time and other factors was in the favor of the Texans because more and more people were coming to Texas and fewer and fewer Indians were surviving because with the Europeans coming into Texas, they brought diseases that were killing the Indians. So the numbers on the Indian side were diminishing. The numbers of the, Tex the Texan settlers were increasing. And so there was this turning point, and there's a famous battle, you can look it up, but there was this famous battle with Captain Jack Hayes and 50 Texas Rangers took on 200 Comanche Indians. Now the story, um, 
is told that there were only 80 of them. Um, then they said that they killed 80 of them and there were 200 of them. Um, then when they went back to the battlefield, they only found actually a dozen uh, dead Indians. So the story varies and, <laughs> and maybe got embellished a little bit, but the best I can tell and what would make sense is there were 50 rangers, five were killed, there were about 200 Indians, and at least 80 were killed or wounded. And the difference in the battle, the, the Indians learned the tactic that um, you know the, the Europeans had flintlocks or percussion rifles with one shot. They would feign a charge, hide, the settlers shoot, they now know they have to reload, and then they attack. Um, in this particular battle is the first time uh, that the Rangers all had two, this is my prop, the Rangers all had two of these, so they had 10 shots. So the, the Indians um, feigned a charge, the te Texas Rangers shot one time, the Indians said all clear, and they attacked, and it would make sense that they would literally wipe them out. They now had 10 repeating shots, and uh, the Indians were totally taken off guard. Now this is called a turning point in the uh, Indian Wars, because before this time, the Texas Rangers t typically came out on the short end of the stick. From this time on, the Indians never really won a major battle against the Texas Rangers. Okay, now enter Sam Walker. Now Sam Walker was also a Texas Ranger and he was also had one of these and he also absolutely loved it. Now, a direct quote from Sam Walker and Jack Hayes would be, they heard the news comes that the Colt company, the Colt Patterson went bankrupt. They said, are you freaking kidding me? What the heck? They couldn't figure it out. This is the best, this won the battle for them and now the tide has turned in the war with the Indians. They can't imagine, why would anybody discontinue making these pistols and rifles and they also ordered some of the shotguns. So they, they love this feature, this repeating uh, cylinder, repeating shot cylinder. So the state of Texas actually appointed Sam Walker to go back, he didn't fly, I was gonna say fly back. <laughs> They had Sam Walker travel to uh, Hartford, Connecticut, where he met with um, Samuel Colt. And he offered to partner with him on, let's reconstitute uh, the company. Uh, in exchange for you starting up again, we will give, the state of Texas will give you an order for a thousand uh, new pistols, which has been named um, the Colt Walker. Uh, I have one here. I get a big smile on my face when I pick this up because this thing, <laughs> first of all, it weighs five pounds. And you could definitely do curls using this. Um, very, very top heavy. I figure if, if you want to attack the enemy, the best thing to do is club them over the head with this thing. This is huge. Uh, well, let's just compare it. So here is the Colt Patterson, again, not engraved, Colt Patterson that they had been using. Um, Sam Walker came with a list of improvements. He said, remember everything's bigger in Texas? He said, we need it bigger. The 36 caliber is not enough. He, of course, wants a 44 caliber. 44 caliber, I actually have one of the balls. No comment. Um, there's a, that's the 44 caliber uh, versus this one. Yeah, so obviously uh, the ball is a lot bigger and um, going into the cylinder and the loading rod, um, you can see the size of the 44 caliber ball. Uh, but this is a really uh, a heavy gun. So they made it in 44 caliber. They made it a lot bigger, more powerful. They did change the design on the trigger. You can see the trigger here with the uh, square back um, is what it's called. Uh, they made, they did order a thousand of these and actually the Colt company did reconstitute itself. It had new investors, which basically the state of Texas put up the money to order a thousand. They only made 1,100 of these. So 1,000 went to Texas and 100 uh, went to commercial buyers. If you look over my shoulder, this is actually a replica. So I need to say this right away, that this is a replica. Um, one of the characteristics, first of all, the cylinder is huge, uh, much bigger, much heavier, much longer barrel. And uh, the loading rod actually has a pointed tip. The model that came after this was actually the Dragoon. And most, this is where most of you go, oh yeah, I've heard of the Colt Dragoon. Um, you can see that the loading rod is different. So in terms of the profile, 
Uh, the Dragoons actually had the same square back, but then later on, they made about 20,000 Dragoons as opposed to 1,000 of the Walkers. And the early ones had the square back, and then later they just went with the round, and the Dragoon eventually became the single action army. That's basically the history of the success of the Colt factory. Uh, but again, with the help of the state of Texas, and Walker, Captain Sam Walker, with their help and the improvements that they made, they made um, these. They made a thousand, and then they quickly went to the Dragoon. Let's talk about that transition. This thing really is heavy. <laughs> but before I talk about the transition, let me just tell you an interesting piece of history. So after all that work that uh, Sam Walker did to have the redesign, help them get started, he goes back to Texas. The pistols arrived, and he was killed. Um, it was the, now is the Mexican-American War. It was 1847. Uh, these pistols, I think this one is actually dated. Uh, and again, this is a replica. This is uh, dated 1847. And in fact, these were delivered in 1847. And Sam Walker was killed um, in the Mexican-American War. Uh, there are two accounts, again, it's Texas. There's two accounts. One said he was uh, killed by a lance. Uh, and then another uh, story is that he was shot in the back with a shotgun. Um, most people say it was the latter, but that sounds very unromantic. So they uh, would like their heroes to die at the end of a lance. Now here was the problem with this particular design, which nobody anticipated. After shooting about 200 rounds, the cylinder would break. Uh, what they found was that this cylinder actually was too large and it, it held 60 grams of powder. And when you filled it with 60 grams of powder, um, the cylinder would weaken and eventually crack. So what they did is they told them to, you know, don't fill it all the way. Um, and then they immediately changed production uh, and came out with the Dragoon, which you see here, and that held 50 grams of powder. So instead of 60 grams, they lowered it and that seemed to solve the problem. Uh, they very quickly, again, they made 20,000 of the Dragoons. They're named Dragoon because they went to uh, pony soldiers or cavalry uh, back then. They called them Dragoons and that's how it got its name. Uh, and that led to the production of the single action army. One, uh, for you movie buffs, one other important piece of history. Uh, I like this poster, The Outlaw Josie Whale. If you've never watched that movie, it's a classic. Outlaw Josie Whale, and I think his female co-star, he ended up marrying her. I don't remember her name. But in this, he, he had two of these Colt Walkers, and these things are beasts. So when he, he, walks, <laughs> he walks down the street, he's shooting the Union soldiers. He's walking down this uh, wooden plank sidewalk, and he's just bam, 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 just shooting them one after another. I can't imagine it because you have to cock it. I can barely hold it. Look, see my hand shaking? I can't hold it. Uh, you try to hold it and cock it and then fire it. It's just, it's a beast. That's all I can say. So movie props, um, notwithstanding, uh, this was a gun that helped to win the West. Um, also another movie where this was used, uh, it is used in True Grit. And I think the female character, Maddie, shot one of these in that movie movie. Well, I hope you like that history lesson. I learned so much. I hope you did too. And I was really outside my wheelhouse. Actually, in this case, it was the paddle wheelhouse. Get it? Um, thanks for watching. Make sure you like and subscribe. I've been doing a lot on uh, German guns and I'm going to go back to those, but I thought we'd take a pause and learn something new.